Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Wadham podcast on psychosocial aspects of the coronavirus outbreak. And we are fortunate today to be talking to Dr. Todd Benham, who is a board-certified clinical psychologist and the installation director of psychological health at Fort Drum, New York, uh, where he's been for the last 19 years. He's responsible for the provision of behavioral health care to over 35,000 beneficiaries, providing expertise and guidance on improving the behavioral health of Fort Drum. He has extensive worldwide experience teaching and training soldiers, family members, and civilian personnel on the impacts of PTSD and traumatic brain injury on the military population. So welcome, Dr. Benham. It is uh, a pleasure to have you uh, with us here in the Wadham podcast. Um, Why don't we begin by talking a little bit about uh, some aspects um, of this coronavirus pandemic uh, from the psychosocial perspective. And if I may ask, um, what is what is uh, your opinion on um, with the various uh, different kinds of information that we are getting? Um, uh, when I say we, I say not just healthcare workers, but the population in general. Um, you know, what do you what do you uh, recommend as far as getting the right information? You know, how you might do that, and and how to use it um, uh, in the right way, and to know it's actually correct information that you're getting. That's a, a great question, and. Uh, one of the things I've been thinking about, uh, you know, is media and information can really create a certain degree of anxiety. So I looked at a headline recently and it said, we are doomed. And so when people read a headline like that, it can really stir up anxiety. Um, and so, you know, we are, we are used to being able to access information at a moment's notice. We can find the answer to essentially any question within a matter of seconds just by a quick search of the Internet. Uh, but when you're searching for answers for something like the coronavirus, something that's novel, we just don't have the data and the evidence to answer the questions that people are really wanting the answers uh, for. So when people are anxious, we tend to um, really demand answers in a certain sense. We want the answers now, which is understandable. We want to figure out how do we prevent this? How do we mitigate risk of exposure? Are there potential cures on the horizon? that sort of thing. If you look through any kind of news or social media feed, you'll see there are all sorts of debates about, you know, is coronavirus uh, a real thing or is this something created by the government as a political stunt? Um, And so it's really unclear sometimes what is a reputable or factual source of information. So we hear a lot today about fact checking and Uh, Fact-checking, I think, is probably the most important thing when you're uh, considering information, especially with something like coronavirus. Now, some folks, um, when you're fact-checking, they might only look for other information that really confirms their existing belief. So my encouragement to people is try to disprove your belief. Try to disprove the information that you're getting, um, and that will bring you to a a host of different sources with different opinions uh, that will eventually lead to what we would call, you know, an overwhelming uh, amount of evidence leading towards one direction. Now, when you're thinking about different social media platforms, as an example, lots of folks are getting their information there. Um, And it's not that there can't be something reputable posted on social media platform, uh, but there are a lot of things that are not accurate on social media. As an example, you might be scrolling through a social media feed. I did this just recently, and I wasn't even trying to look at, you know, anything about coronavirus, but I saw an article posted uh, by four or five or six people, and it it, it talked about gargling salt water or blowing hot air into your throat as a way to mitigate the coronavirus. Um, So suddenly that is reposted and reposted and reposted, and you have... uh, really the ability to influence hundreds or thousands of people on something that is not accurate. And that can either create anxiety if it's a doomsday approach, or it can really give a a false sense of security or actually um, create potential risk of injury if somebody is, for example, using a a blow dryer to heat up their throat. Um, And some folks we know are actually posting malicious information, which is even more problematic. Uh, We know there are some very reputable sources. Uh, Obviously, the CDC, the World Health Organization, are the most reputable sources for finding information about the coronavirus. 
Uh, a lot of major medical centers are putting out reputable information as well. And so those are the sources that I really direct people to. Um, but even when you're reading those things, you, you want to look to confirm the information with another source. Uh, there's a lot of opinion, source, uh, opinion pieces or anecdotal stories of a single person or a couple of people. And perhaps there are facts in that, um, but perhaps there is a story about one person. And sometimes those stories can get sensationalized uh, if they're not creating uh, a, a broad source of information on a topic and giving one person's version. So we need to take an anecdotal story for what it is. It's one person's account, and it may not even be a person that we know of, and so perhaps it's not trustworthy. So we're really trying to work to validate the source of whatever it is we're reviewing. Uh, if we can't validate it, okay, we can still read it, but let's reflect the fact that we don't have a way to validate that. Uh, if we can validate the source, we know where it's coming from, then let's try to you know, see what is the reputation of that source, and let's look for another source that can confirm or deny that initial information. The process takes time, um, and it, it's really an important piece for people to remember, so we're not just posting information or spreading information that is inaccurate. Um, so I think that's really the biggest thing is get your source, validate the source, and then confirm it with other sources. Knowing that with something like with coronavirus, we're not gonna have all of the answers uh, until probably months and even years from now. Very interesting, very interesting. And actually segues um, nicely into the second question that I, I have for you, and that is, um, so we have large numbers of population uh, globally that are, that are right now uh, in some degree of isolation. So either they're um, ill or have sick contacts to the point where they're actually self-quarantining at home, or they're under some uh, guidelines to you know stay at home and uh, social distancing, but um, you know, are pretty much not going out um, uh, as they normally would. What what coping strategies would you suggest uh, for those who are, um, you know, essentially uh, in their home for for most of the time uh, uh, of the day and and not you know having that social interaction as they normally do? You know, one aspect of it, as you're bringing up, is that you're exposed to all of this um, media driven and other, uh, information that's coming from every angle, it seems, and, you know, how, how you cope with that, but also how do you just cope with, with, you know, the, the some degree of isolation and, um, not having that, that typical social, uh, interaction and contact that you normally would. Sure. And this does go along with the fact that, you know, we can access information at a moment's notice and we can also connect with others, um, easier than we've ever been able to do. Social messaging really has made that an easy, uh, thing for us to access. However, a digital connection or connecting through social media is also oftentimes brief and superficial. So you might be lacking that deeper social connection that comes from an in-person contact or a physical contact with somebody else. So understandably, we are really trying to emphasize social distancing during this period of the coronavirus. Um, and so the human need for connection is being restricted. Uh, and, and you can see that people are getting distressed by that and, and longing for and yearning for connection with people. Uh, and, and even on top of that, there's a stigma associated with some folks who are either ill with perhaps a coronavirus or another illness. And, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it makes people nervous even just to cough or sneeze in public right now because you might garner a disapproving look from somebody nearby you, and that can create some, some negative stigma. But when I talk with people about increasing social connection, I, I really encourage people to increase the common means of electronic communication that they're already using. So increase your use of sending text messages or your other brief social media interactions. Those are great means of increasing communication. But in addition to that, when we're not having that in-person contact, I really would encourage people to think about ways where they can engage in deeper communication or connection um, using those digital means. So is it possible to send a video message uh, to somebody that has a little more connection, they can see your face, they can hear your voice, your expressions, et cetera. Sending that especially to, to parents or relatives or friends, um, you, you know, potentially to folks who might be older who aren't as engaged in uh, some of the uh, I would call them the newer social media kinds of platforms. 
uh, even writing a letter to someone uh, or even really uh, old-fashioned using the telephone uh, call, actually calling somebody and speaking to them spending some quality time with them I think in the, at this point we're talking about time spent with somebody and increasing the actual quality of the connection um, especially considering those folks who are extra vulnerable during this time they maybe have limited social supports or they live alone uh, one of the things I've been telling people when they're increasing their connection or, or having any connection is try to limit discussions related to the coronavirus. Um, I think it's un unreasonable to say let's totally eliminate it, um, but I really want folks to try to have conversation and discussion that is not focused on the coronavirus. That's difficult now because if you ask somebody, you know, how are you doing, and they've been social distancing uh, and most of our media and lives is, uh, are consumed right now by the coronavirus, but this is a, a time, think of some other questions that you can ask somebody. What are you and your family doing during this time? Uh, tell me something about yourself that I didn't know before. Uh, those sorts of things. I also really recommend humor. Uh, this can be a little bit precarious because some people um, might find making jokes about the coronavirus uh, as, as the humorous thing. However, that can be um, offensive to some folks. So you have to know your audience with that because I think uh, appropriately so, we are sensitive to the fact that coronavirus is having a major impact on the world. And so I really would say, you know, humor is great, but try to steer clear of humor about the actual virus. Um, if you can find ways to engage with your support, support system that is not necessarily on the digital platform, that is great as well. So this is something in the home front. Many of us probably are not used to spending this much time with our family at home. So, you know, can we go back and, and do a board game or, uh, you know, take a, a walk around the neighborhood together or, uh, you know, do something engaging, learning a new skill or a hobby together um, in the actual home with the people uh, that, you know, essentially are sharing a quarantine with you. And then last, from a community perspective, I've, I've really been impressed watching in my own community, seeing different organizations uh, provide services through different media platforms. Uh, so I've seen that in different sorts of um, you know, children's activities, for example, um, putting stories online, putting curriculum online, doing dance classes online. Uh, I've seen civic and religious organizations offer meetings and services through their digital platforms. Uh, I've seen these organizations ask their leadership to reach out uh, to the people that are attending those organizations. So there's just a lot of creative ways to engage in that. Um, and, and ultimately, everybody has a different level of need for social connection, but everybody does need it. So I think that one of the things that is, is really the greatest is just seeing uh, the community bond, but in a different way and in a creative way. And I think if we keep that up and just really intentionally reach out to folks, we can help with that isolation. Yeah, that's uh, that's some great stuff, Todd, and um, you know, really appreciate uh, all that insight um, because I think a lot of people are struggling, you know, under this uh, this current situation, and and um, you know, you provide a lot of great options and, and insight to that. Um, and you know, another thing, and I, you touched on it briefly, um, is uh, this idea and uh, of of the, the kind of managing your your chronic illness um, through this uh, crisis. You know, it's it's anecdotal, but I've had a number of contacts from around the world, actually, who are uh, people with chronic conditions. And of course, you know, life goes on, and, and your healthcare goes on. And normally, you might seek out uh, care on a regular basis for these, these conditions. But now there's this stigma attached to it. It's almost as if any illness um, has this this sort of um, label placed on it, like, oh boy, it's it's the coronavirus. And in in some places, I've heard some real interesting and, and concerning stories. Uh, where that that stigma actually amounts to a lot more, um, actually being uh, you know brought into a, a, a quarantine you know um, situation that perhaps you didn't want to go into outside of your home, um, other you know sort of labels that are that are put on you, um, you know from a societal standpoint, it's 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 pretty concerning. What would you recommend for for people who are managing their their chronic illnesses now, um, you know through this novel uh, uh, coronavirus? It's a, it's a really a great point and a great question. So 
you know, I think about, uh, you know, in different parts of the of uh, the world, spring is here, and and you know, so with springs come seasonal allergies, for example, um, and some people struggle more with asthma at this time of the year, and you know, so uh, or people have other common colds, or the flu is still around, and that sort of thing, and um, you know, or other sorts of uh, pulmonary disease and things like that. So um, the, the first thing is, you know, I, th I think we all need to work towards being gracious to each other in this time. Um, and so uh, if somebody does give me an odd look because I've coughed or sneezed, I, I, I'm going to hopefully give them the benefit of the doubt and, and say, maybe they're looking at me oddly because they think I have the virus, or maybe they're just extra anxious because they have a, a loved uh, one or a family member that they're concerned about. So I think we're all a little bit on edge. And I think if we acknowledge that from the start, it gives us a little more patience in dealing with one another. But when I think about folks who really, you know, do have underlying health conditions, uh, it's especially difficult to manage because not only are they managing how people might be viewing them, they're having to manage their health conditions and maybe with a different degree um, of preparation they ha than they have previously. And so I think one thing that will help uh, folks with underlying health conditions manage some of the stress and anxiety that goes with it is making sure that they have what they need. Um, I, I know people are perhaps stockpiling some things that they don't need or hoarding some things that they don't need, but it is really important that those people with underlying health conditions have access to, uh, for example, the medications that they need. Uh, and perhaps they need to make sure that they have some folks uh, that can pick up those medications for them on their behalf. So arranging with the doctor or the pharmacy to uh, have somebody else be able to pick their medications as needed. Um, sometimes people with underlying health conditions might um, have to even limit themselves more, so more of a, of a self-imposed quarantine. And so I would recommend that if that's the case, um, those around them really need to make sure that they are reaching out to them to, to ensure their basic needs are met. So how are they getting their groceries, for example? Um, or, or is somebody delivering food to them? How will they request medical care? Um, and it, it gets a, a particularly trick, tricky if somebody has a communication issue or a cognitive impairment. And so in those situations, it's really important for the caregivers to make sure that they're, uh, say, for example, communicating very clearly and concisely the fact uh, that they do need to probably increase their level of uh, personal hygiene when it comes to hand sanitation and, and things like that. Um, and if there's cognitive impairment, there might be, need to be a little more investment or time spent in helping somebody manage during this time. Uh, another thing would be really helping the person stay active. So in, in, uh, in all of us, but especially in, in an elderly population, you know, are there some daily physical exercises they can perform at home? Uh, you know, can they do some stretching activities? Can they do some uh, even just walking around the house? Or uh, depending on the level of impairment, can they do some exercises from seated on a chair, that sort of thing? Um, I think we probably all acknowledge that anybody would get more agitated and irritable uh, during this sort of situation. And so, uh, I think, again, with folks who might have some cognitive decline or dementia, that might increase. Routines are important. Um, so schedule as much as possible. Try to get things um, in a consistent pattern, and then that will give you a purpose and meaning throughout the day. And I think a lot of folks are you know, commenting, again, anecdotally, that they're getting all sorts of things and projects done at the house that they haven't previously done. And maybe somebody who's uh, immunocompromised or has an underlying health condition can't engage that as much. They maybe can't do as many projects, but they can do other things to keep a routine going. Um, even if it's doing a crossword puzzle, you know, having your morning tea, coffee, um, knowing that your loved one is going to call you on the phone at 11 o'clock, those sorts of things will keep somebody going during a time like this. Great. Yeah, those are some, some great, um, great ideas and ways to cope. Um, so, so uh, Todd, let's move into the um, the healthcare uh, realm. So, you know, uh, m most of our members now are, are are fighting this disease from the healthcare standpoint. They're on the front lines. Uh, most of the people listening to this around the world, uh, and you know, there are, there are concerns about about their own 
the personal well-being and and in the situation. So, what what advice would you have for uh, healthcare organizations, but also you know the healthcare workers that might be listening to this, as far as maintaining their own um, psychosocial well-being, uh, you know, through this pandemic. So my my main focus um, in th- on this topic is really addressing leaders of an organization. So my hope is that there are some uh, folks who are leaders that are listening to this or that will listen to this. And to uh, to varying degrees, we are probably all leaders uh, as healthcare workers. We're all, to some degree directing other people at some point. Um, but as I would say, the the senior leaders of an organization there is a tremendous burden on those people. And it's times like these when the leaders of the healthcare team need to lead from the front. They really need to step into the spotlight to communicate with their teams. And you might see uh, healthcare leaders really engaging the patients in the community, but I would say it's equally or more important for the healthcare leadership team to actually communicate with their medical team. as a world, we are really uh, in, in a peritraumatic state right now. So depending on where you are, you might be uh, either, say, in the initial recovery from a trauma associated with a pandemic, perhaps you're at the height of the trauma, or perhaps you're just entering the height of the trauma. Uh, but in that sense, when you're in a, uh, a peritraumatic sense, we're, we're really looking at leaders even providing something like a psychological first aid to their healthcare team. So that means you have to focus on your healthcare worker's safety. You need to be calm and decisive and ultimately communicate hope to your team by calling on and reinforcing the efficacy of the team. That will really inspire people and keep people motivated. It can't be uh, a false motivation, right? It really needs to be believing in your team that they can accomplish the task. Uh, With respect to safety, I think it's important for leaders to talk with their staff about what they are doing to ensure their safety. At the same time, acknowledging they cannot guarantee 100% employee safety. So communicating what you know, what you don't know, and then what you're trying to fix or address. Uh, As well, leaders need to really have that decisive and assertive leadership. Not a dictatorial type of leadership, Uh, really one where the leader surrounds him or herself with a a, a team that is communicating regularly and making expedient decisions. Uh, Part of that is also empowering junior leaders to to make decisions at their level. Uh, When you're in a pandemic or in a crisis, you can't bring everything back up to the CEO or the CMO and say, please make this decision. We have to empower those leaders to make their own decisions. Uh, and I think if you think about, you know, a high reliability organization, for example, uh, one of the tenets of that is that you're inviting potential solutions or suggestions from everyone on the team. So from uh, the brand new LPN, for example, that just started with the team uh, to the most senior physician on the team, each person uh, needs to have their opinions be validated and that will give people buy-in when they know that their ideas are being considered and perhaps even implemented. Uh, And also I think leaders need to also be gracious during this time. So recognizing the staff is probably going to have some intense emotions. There's probably going to be irritability, frustration, there's going to be conflicts. And if we anticipate there's going to be conflict, we can allow it but manage it before it gets out of hand correct the major issues, let the minor issues kind of drop by the wayside. If that leader is absent, the healthcare team is going to get frustrated. Um, so that's it's just so important for the leadership to be out there and for the, the leaders to watch how their team is responding in a crisis. From a real practical perspective, um, healthcare workers need to make sure that they are maintaining an appropriate balance of uh, work and outside of work life. Um, so in the work setting, take a break. Um, you know, Go to your leadership and, and make sure that you have a rotation that allows you as a healthcare worker to reset physically, emotionally. Uh, sometimes healthcare workers are not great at taking care of themselves. Uh, it's one of the things that makes a healthcare worker good at healthcare is they take care of other people. Uh, but you can't take care of somebody else if you're not taking care of yourself. Um, so that includes just your basics of Are you getting good nutrition? Are you hydrating enough? Uh, We certainly don't want a medical 
worker to be dehydrated and, and be unable to care for, for somebody or for a patient or for himself, and, and also making sure you're getting a good time of rest. Uh, you know, not everybody joins healthcare thinking that they're going to be in disaster medicine. Um, but really, at this point, we're moving in that direction for many people who didn't anticipate that. So it might be a more intense level of crisis for somebody, and uh, those who are more seasoned might need to go alongside those people and help them determine their priorities. So first, it's helping them find out, what is my home life like? Um, have I talked with my significant other, my spouse, my children, and perhaps delegated duties at home that I might have previously managed but I can't right now? Um, so can the family help out with something different? Um, if I know that my family is safe and my home is safe, including my pets and my children and, and my bills are taken care of, that will help me be able to focus better and maintain my resilience in the workforce. Uh, when you're thinking about basic stress management things, you know, these are things that healthcare workers know, but we don't implement. So I really encourage folks to find a partner, a buddy who will help you remember to maintain your basic needs. So check in with somebody. Hey, are you getting sufficient sleep? Did you eat lunch yet? Did you have breakfast? Um, let's go for a five-minute walk around um, wherever it is that you're working. Uh, really ensuring that you're taking care of one another and, and really enforcing that. There's also some really basic strategies that people can do. So even taking a few minutes and doing a five or 10 minute breathing or relaxation strategy, very easy to find them just on the internet. There's a lot of apps that do them. And doing a few minutes of breathing or relaxation can really allow your body to uh, distance itself from the coronavirus, reset, find your purpose, find your mission, and then go from there. Uh, and then the last piece in this is really uh, in empowering healthcare workers to set boundaries, setting them with your leadership, your colleagues, your subordinates. Um, that will give people a sense of control, and it allows you to be able to provide better care in the midst of a crisis. So as you do that, um, you know, setting boundaries will hopefully increase your ability to collaborate. So you have more consultation, you have more supervision, um, and then ultimately you'll know what you can and cannot control as you manage this uh, pandemic. Boy, that's some, some great stuff, Todd, and, um, you know, very, very applicable to these times. I think, um, uh, you know, those who have um, endured uh, through crises and, and, you know, been, been part of the response to a crisis, um, you know, I think in, in the, the several that I have done and, and um, uh, looking back, you know, one thing about uh, that I, there's no typical crisis, but I'll say a typical crisis is that you can sort of see the, the finish line. You can see, you know, when this is going to end. Most crises have uh, somewhat of a distinct um, onset and then also, you know, have somewhat of a distinct um, ending. I think in, in this one, in, in a pandemic in general, you know, part of the, the um, what's taken, a, I think, a psychosocial toll on everyone, including healthcare workers, most importantly, um, is that, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't see the, the finish line. We don't see exactly when and how this is going to end. I mean, it will end, but that's a little bit of a nebulous, um, uh, you know, point right now. When is it going to end? How is it going to end? You know, so I think that, that, you know, brings up some of a lot of the issues that you talked about and you bring up some great strategies for that. Let's move into the last um, question I'd like to ask you. And this is going to be a little bit of a tough one because um, I don't think there's any easy answer to this. I'm looking forward to, to hearing what you have to say. But um, it's about the, the PPE, the personal protective equipment. And, you know, as you well know, um, there are various uh, uh, levels of, of PPE that, that are being implemented in different situations in the clinical uh, realm, uh, but also there's there's shortages. I mean, frank, quite frankly, there are shortages of PPE. So could you talk a little bit about, uh, you know, a healthcare workers' strategies, psychosocial strategies, strategies in this current environment of um, variable PPE, PPE shortages? Um, how does one, you know, sort of proceed through that? You're right, Greg. That is, that is probably the, the toughest question. Um, and you know, I think I heard yesterday that uh, New York City announced that it had what they thought was about 10 days left of, of PPE. Um, and so, you know, as a healthcare worker and as a community member, um, 
you know, that raises some significant anxiety, and I think appropriately so. Now, ordinarily, anxiety is much easier to manage or address when there is an unrealistic fear. Um, you know, so if I fear um, something that's really out of the ordinary or if you're getting struck by lightning, for example, I probably don't really need to fear that. But this is something uh, that is a reality that, uh, you know, is a reality to a varying degree depending on the location of the healthcare worker and that sort of thing. So I think it's important to acknowledge first that there is an ethical dilemma uh, when healthcare workers are asked to put themselves and then subsequently their families at risk because they don't have the necessary equipment to safely perform their jobs. So I think we have to acknowledge that from the, from the beginning. Uh, what I am suggesting to people is, first of all, acknowledge that, uh, acknowledge that it's a concern and be forthright with yourself regarding why you're doing your job, so your purpose and your mission, and then ultimately to what level of risk are you willing to engage. And this has to be really based on each person's uh, individual belief system and we don't really want to bring a, a judgment against that person's belief system now certainly there are potential consequences uh, whichever path you choose but it, it is each individual provider or healthcare workers uh, belief I want to give an example real quick so if you think of this so if, if if there were a car accident and 10 different healthcare workers arrived to that scene of the car accident and say the victim was in respiratory dis distress how many of those workers would attempt to aid a patient without some sort of PPE? Out of 10, I don't know the answer to that. My guess is some probably would and some would not. And I've asked different healthcare workers, you know, would you, for instance, do, you know, mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation on somebody? And I've heard some say absolutely not, and I've heard some say absolutely yes, I would. Um, that, in those scenarios, a uh, little different from an actual workplace, but it is the individual person's choice. Now, if you're in a facility, again, it's different because you have to consider, you know, your job and the consequences of decisions that you make, but it is that person's decision. And if you're, if you know what your boundaries are as a uh, healthcare worker, it will at least give you some sense of stability with your decision and the rationale behind your decision. Now, again, if you're talking about, uh, you know, sort of managing the anxiety that goes with the PPE, uh, my first recommendation is find out accurately from your leadership what is your PPE, avail what is the actual uh, availability of PPE? How many masks are on site? How many days of supplies do you have? How many gowns, uh, eye protection, that sort of thing? If it is adequate and sufficient, then hopefully that should calm to some degree that person's uh, level of concern about it. In that kind of situation, I would really you know, encourage the person to focus on what they do have and then also think about ways to optimize the supply uh, of their N95s, for example. So I know the CDC has a checklist that gives a whole uh, list of ideas of how to basically uh, keep your supply greater for a longer period of time. And that's a very important thing because if you're doing something to uh, keep those N95s available, it will help use some of that anxious energy. Now, if the PPE is actually inadequate or you're running out soon or you've already run out, then we have a, a different path to take. Um, and I think it's important that we really uh, ask leadership and press leadership of the organization to say, what are you asking us to do? Uh, what are the alternative suggestions if we're in a, in a shortage? I've seen lots of folks are, are making masks, for example, but we really don't know the efficacy of those masks. So yes, it's a barrier to some degree, but we don't know what the efficacy is. Um, so I, I think it's incumbent on the healthcare worker. Well, first it's incumbent on the leadership to to give a plan to the worker, but it's also incumbent on the, the worker to ask the leadership what that plan is. Um, and then this, the, the CDC does have some, I would say, last resort sorts of um, plans, contingency plans or crisis plans if the, the, shortage is, the shortage is extended. And then the healthcare worker has to decide, am I willing to do that 
or am I not willing to do that? Um, and that goes back to, have I figured out what my purpose and mission and what my plan is? If I have, then I'll be okay with my decision later on down the road. Um, so not necessarily great answers, but um, you know, if the provider or the healthcare worker knows what he's doing and why he's doing it, it will give a better sense of the, the potential outcomes. Well, that's that's some terrific insight, um, Todd, and thank you so much for for sharing um, all this great information. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of people out there on the front lines. Um, there's also a lot of people, um, you know, most of the population of the world right now who are living different lifestyles than they normally live. And while we concentrate a lot on you know the medical aspects of this, how do we treat the disease? How do we prevent it, you know from getting it? Um, you know, what what's the management issues? How do we handle surge? Um, this is a very important piece of it. You know, how do we handle the psychosocial aspect of this this pandemic? You know, something the world really, in, in recent history, has not has, has not seen before. Um, so, uh, maintaining the, the, the psychosocial well-being of the, of the population in general, um, and and importantly of the healthcare workforce, I think is an extremely important thing. So, thank you again for sharing. Um, you know, your your information and your insight, um, Dr. Benham. We we truly appreciate it. And um, thank you for what you do, and, and good luck in all of your efforts. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much.